Hi, this is AMK, and you're watching what will probably be the last segment of part six in my series about the Benoit family murders. Since it took longer than expected to get this out to you, I'm skipping the music and video intro so we can get right to it. And at the end of the video, there will be some important updates about my channel and things I'm working on, so make sure you stick around to check that out. And also, real quick before we get started, I need to add this in here. In the previous video, I talked about Benoit meeting Raymond Raleigh to purchase tights on Friday, June 22nd, 2007. And I meant to include this image of the check that Benoit gave to Rawls. So here it is, and apologies for not catching that mistake during editing of that video. So with that out of the way, let's get into today's video. Okay, and today we are going to take a look at the investigator supplemental reports from Detective Lee and Detective Hergesel. So let's get going. Okay, I'm gonna try this again. I didn't mean for it to be this long in between videos. I ended up being sick between Christmas and New Year's. Not the COVID sick, just with like a, a stomach virus thing. And I was trying to record this and I just kept bitching about everything I saw wrong with this and I was like man this is not gonna be good <laughs> like, so I'm just gonna try to start over so anyway we're gonna start with Detective Lee and we're gonna start back in um this is Detective Harper's supplemental report that we've already gone through in some of the earlier parts of the series so we're going to start with this section about the alarm and the security gate. So Detective Harper says at the residence, I also met with Detective B. Lee. Oh, and that was one other thing that I had in, in the part that I threw out. I was giggling that wouldn't that be cool if his name was Bruce Lee. And I was telling this story about how I actually had a teacher in high school whose name was Bruce Lee. And then my son, well, he had the same teacher. Well, anyway, but um, actually I did look into that and his name is Brian Lee, not Bruce. So see how much I look into this? I am looking at everything and everybody. <laughs> it was good, but anyway, I threw out that entire clip just to say the same. Ah, uh, fuck it. I also met with Detective B. Lee and Burke McMichael from TTI Security. Detective Lee asked McMichael to meet at the residence in order to access the alarm keypad and download any keypad activity. The only activity logged in the keypad was on June 18th, 2007. The keypad activity showed the alarm was armed at 12.16 a.m. and activated at 12.43 a.m. and then deactivated with a proper user code. So that's interesting, I think, because, well, as I've been going through these documents, I'm literally chronicling every date and everything that I'm reading through here and putting it in my own timeline. And I will share that with you when I have it presentable. Right now, it's just scribbles with arrows on note paper. <laughs> Like I said, I'm building up to this. This is a series. If I would put this all in one video, it would be forever long because there's, well, let's, let me see, 464 pages, as you can see right here in the top right. And we've probably only gone through maybe 100 of those pages at this point. So I still have a ways to go. So if you're still watching this and you're tuning back in to see what's coming next, thank you so much. We're on one hell of a ride together. <laughs> We're gonna see where we end up. <laughs> the alarm activity was consistent with information received from the Fayette County 911 Center advising of the alarm activation at the Benoit residence. A deputy responded and met with Chris Benoit, who had just returned from out of town and had set off the alarm when he entered the residence. Detective Lee also advised that he spoke with Larry Huggins of Southern Gate Works, who installed the electric gate on the Benoit property. Huggins told Detective Lee that the security gate at the Benoit residence was unable to store any information such as entry logs or activation times. Huggins advised there was no way to determine if the gate had previously been opened or activated. And we're going to go now to Detective Lee's supplemental report to see what he has to say more in detail about this. So I'll see you when we get there. 
Okay, and here we are in the supplemental reports. And as you can see, this is Detective Lee's summary. And Detective Lee says on June 26, 2007, about 1300 hours, which would be one o'clock p.m., Detective Lee says, I spoke to Larry Huggins with Southern Gateworks, which we just read in the alarm and security gate section in Detective Harper's report. And I asked him if the security gate of 130 Green Meadow Lane stored entry slash exit times, dates, codes, etc. And Larry said that the system installed for the Benoit's home did not have the capability to store anything other than the access code signals. Larry went on to say there was no way to know when, if, or what time the gate had been activated. And just like roll this around in your head a little bit. Maybe you're seeing the scenario that I'm picturing that what if maybe somebody met Chris Benoit at the gate when he came home that day on the 18th? We're going to look further at that. What all went on after the 18th? From the 18th to the 22nd, when they allege that was when he began this rampage where he murdered Nancy. We're going to look at that. What happened in between the 18th when this alarm was triggered and then deactivated? What happened between the 18th and the 22nd? We're going to look at that very closely. After speaking with Larry, I met with Burke McMichael, and then phone number redacted, at 130 Green Meadow Lane. Burke installed and maintained the home security system, TTI security systems. Burke said that the home alarm system stored only limited information. Burke accessed the alarm keypad next to the laundry room entry exit door. Burke said that the last and only activity stored on the system was a, quote, armed no entry, end quote, on June 18th, 2007 at 2416 hours, which would be 16 minutes past midnight. The alarm was deactivated on 618, 2007 at 2443 hours, which would be 43 minutes after midnight by user code number 17. I asked Burke who user code 17 was, and he said there was no way to know. So was it Chris or was it Nancy? Or was it somebody else who maybe happened to know the security code? Wonder who close to them, maybe in the vicinity, might have known that code? Maybe? I don't know. Who did they trust? Think about that a minute. Now, from 2416 hours to 2443 hours, so that's 27 minutes? So an armed no entry, and then 27 minutes later, the alarm was deactivated. Um, I personally don't have this kind of security alarm system in my home, but if anybody does that's watching, if you could leave a comment below, does this mean, like, what does the armed no entry mean? What, you know, does that signal? So if anybody knows anything, I'm reaching out to you guys. Let me know down below. I did assist in the search of the home for any evidence directly related to the crime and any evidence that could possibly contribute to a motive. I did locate numerous pieces of financial paperwork. It was logged and turned over to crime scene while at the home. And I have tons of financial paperwork in these pages. I have bank statements. I have statements for the, the business that they had, the Wolverine Sports, I believe it was called. I have so much stuff in here, it almost feels wrong to be looking at it. But we're all going to look through that eventually. So then around 1700 hours, which would be 5 o'clock p.m., I received a call from investigator Haskins, who said he was with the New York State Narcotic Enforcement Agency. And that number is not redacted, so there it is. Investigator Haskins said that they had recently closed a case on an at-home pharmacy in New York. He went on to say that the name Christopher Benoit was listed as a steroid customer of this pharmacy. Finally, his agency would assist if necessary. And oh, the questions I have about this. Was it really Christopher Benoit or was it just some tool using his name? Did he ever order anything or was his name just, you know, so many questions. And also remember, on one of the four occasions the police returned to the home to collect evidence, they mentioned this tape. So was the tape kept for evidence that it wasn't 
actually him who was ordering these steroids in his name? Or did they expect to be prosecuted for this or what? Did anything ever come of that? We'll see if we can't find out. We're going to dig into all of that. But let's keep going with Detective Lee. And so then on June 27th, 2007, okay, so then this is the next day at about 10 hundred hours, 10 o'clock a.m. I met with the family of the deceased, Nancy Benoit. I spoke with Nancy's sister, Sandra Toffoloni, at 130 Green Meadow Lane, and we did go over Sandra's statement in part three, I believe. In that video, we went over the statements from Sandra Toffoloni and Pam Clark. I asked Sandra if she knew of any reasons for Chris and Nancy to fight or argue. Sandra said that her sister told her they fought most heatedly about a trust fund that was set up for Chris's three children. She went on to say how mad Nancy would get at Chris for not changing the beneficiary from his ex-wife's name to hers. And I also talk more about that trust fund in the same video I just mentioned, part three. And as always, all links are below. Sandra said that over the last couple of months, Chris had been, quote, unable to perform, end quote, in the marital bedroom. Finally, Sandra said that one of the other major argument subjects was over Nancy hiding Chris's stash. Nancy would often hide various types of drugs that Chris was using. Sandra said that would, quote, piss Chris off to no end. Well, I'm from what I'm seeing in these police files, it wasn't just Chris who had problems with prescription medications. And you can see more about that in the part with the search warrant when I go over all the prescription bottles of the different types of medication that was found in the home, who prescribed that medication, and who it was prescribed to. And also, if any medication was remaining in those bottles, that is all covered in part five, the search warrant. Sandra believed that her sister was fearful of Chris at times. Sandra knew of no reason, however, Chris would do what he did. So again, these people that the police are talking to, they keep saying they were arguing over things. But no matter who police are talking to, the bottom line then is always they know of no reason, however, that he would do what he did. I'm going to say it again, and I think I've said it in every video so far. This should have been looked into more thoroughly, and I feel like this should still be looked into because I think there's a little more to this. Something else went on here. What it is, what it was, your guess is as good as mine. I am not claiming to know anything more than anybody else. All my purpose is in making these videos and providing them to the public is because I feel people need to know what is in these actual police reports because people are watching these mainstream sources that are not telling the truthful, full story. Why they're not doing that, I have no idea. I could speculate, but I don't know. What I do know is that in all of my years of research experience, a lot of times in almost anything that you dig into, no matter what it is, if you follow the money and look into who benefits the most and you dig beneath what they're showing you on the surface, you're going to find the truth under there because they always put like a smoke screen up and they make something really loud and very dramatic and shocking because then that's what people will migrate to. That's more exciting than a boring story of, you know, a home invasion. But if you if you make it shocking and you make it somebody a very public figure, I mean, just take a second to read this article. I'll put the link below. What is the point of this type of verbiage other than to sensationalize this story? And if the media pushes that certain narrative, that is what people will remember. And then anyone trying to claim anything different will be laughed at, called stupid. And no one questions it then because they don't want that kind of criticism. But I can promise you this, conspiracies are very real. They happen all the time. It's the lack of evidence that makes it a theory. And if you take a closer look and you see something with your own eyes that doesn't make sense, shouldn't you at least question it? Which is why, like I keep saying, if you want the truth about anything, you're going to need to take the time to seek out 
original documents. Watch the long video footage. Don't just watch the clips that the media chooses to show you. And that includes me. I'm not asking anybody to take my word for anything. I'm a nobody. I'm showing you what is in the police files, which I feel is rather credible. But still, don't take my opinions. Think for yourself. Always think for yourself. It's okay to ask questions because the only way you're going to find that truth is if you look for it yourself because they are not going to show it to you. And if you're watching these videos and you haven't yet asked yourself what else have they been lying about and consequently what else have we all been wrong about all this time, then well, I say this with love, but it's really time to wake up to reality. I mean, we're talking about a 14, now almost 15-year-old crime, and the majority of people, even hardcore Benoit fans, still believe the hyped-up, sensationalized, media-pushed, and fundamentally false narrative, as we're seeing in these police files. So what if we're not necessarily being told the truth about more serious issues? Issues that truly affect every single one of us, and our daily lives, and our futures. After researching this Benoit crime, I'm starting to really believe that that might be something all of us should take some serious time to consider. I'll leave it at that because I have gotten way off track and I apologize, but I feel something like that needed to be said. And let's get back to what we're all here for, Benoit. Moving on. Okay, and um, next we have another page from Detective Lee, phone interviews. So on 62807, interview with Scott James. Now, way back in part two, when I went through the timeline, I referenced a Scott Armstrong, and I believe in the dark side of the ring, they talked about a Scott Armstrong also receiving strange text messages from Chris Benoit. And so here in the police report, they're talking about Scott James. So I looked into this and it turns out they're the same person. So there's a little example that not everything is a conspiracy, but still proves the point that unless you question everything, you never know for sure. See what I mean? But let's check out what Scott Armstrong James had to say to Detective Lee. Interview with Scott James, phone number redacted. I called Scott to ask him several questions since he sent and received several cell phone calls and text messages to Chris Benoit near the time of his death. Scott said that he spoke to Chris several times on Saturday regarding their upcoming shows for the WWE. And Saturday would have been the 23rd, June 23rd. So then if the timeline of the deaths is accurate, then during this conversation that Scott has with Chris Benoit, Nancy had already been dead for about a day. And this was the day they alleged Daniel had been killed. So Scott said they discussed arrangements regarding rental cars and hotel rooms. Scott said Chris called him and said that Nancy and Daniel were throwing up and very sick and he wasn't sure that he would make the show. If he did, he would be late. Scott said Chris asked him to call one of their bosses named Fit and tell him of his situation. Scott said he received several text messages from Chris telling Scott his home address and the dogs were in the back and the side door to the house would be open. Scott said he made several attempts to call and text Chris on Sunday, which would have been the 24th, and never received a response from Chris. Now the 24th would have been the day they alleged that he committed suicide. I asked Scott several questions about Chris and Nancy's marriage and Chris's health. Scott said he knew they argued but knew of nothing physical. Well, show me a couple that doesn't argue and, I mean, come on. He said he didn't think that Chris had any substance abuse or other addictions. Scott went on to say that Chris was a great father and, quote, the man who did this, I don't know him. An interesting quote. Did he mean that metaphorically? That you know, this isn't the Chris Benoit I knew? Or is he really literally saying, whoever did this, I don't know who it is, literally. Scott said there were no statements that could have been a prelude to what happened. And then it says Scott James, and then 
that may be an address. I don't know for sure, but something's there that they redacted. And on June 30th, 2007, interview with James Roberts. Phone number redacted, redacted. I called James to ask him questions of any contact he had with Chris Benoit prior to his death. James said that he and Chris usually spoke via email. James said he met Chris at the airport once, and since they both had sons the same age, they began to talk once in a while. James said he was expecting tickets to an upcoming pay-per-view for him and his son. When he didn't have any contact via email, James said he checked the WWE website and saw that Chris was scratched from the show due to a family illness. James said he called Chris on Sunday to check his well-being, but no one answered. Uh, James Roberts, redacted, works for TSA at Atlanta Airport. And then his email is redacted. And the TSA, if you don't know, is the Transportation Security Administration. So he's one of the dudes who checks your socks and shoes and all that fun stuff at the airport. And this one's fun. On June 30th, 2007, interview with Chris Jericho Irvine. Oh, I just, sorry. That, uh... Yep, I am a fan. <laughs> uh, phone number redacted. Damn it! I would have so called him up. <laughs> anyway, I am such a freaking nerd. <laughs> I called Chris to see if he had any insight into Chris's death. Jericho said that he hadn't spoke to Chris in a while. He said that he and Chris had been playing phone tags since Father's Day. And uh, just to let you know, I do have some text message records and I have that conversation between Benoit and Jericho around Father's Day. We're slowly but surely getting there, I, I promise. Jericho went on to say that he had known Chris for about 15 years. He said that he had seen a personality change in Chris since the death of his close friend, Eddie Guerrero. He said Chris seemed to be greatly affected by the death of several wrestlers over the last several years. Well, I mean, yeah, wouldn't all of you be? If if you're in this profession and in a, over a few years, your co-workers keep dying, you kind of have to be looking around nervously. <laughs> I mean, I would be. But then again, obviously, I question everything or I wouldn't be doing this. So, of course, I would be looking around like, who's next? I mean, that would literally be what I'm thinking, especially if, especially if you knew of maybe some overprescribing of prescription pain medicine going around, and maybe you noticed that the people who were dying seemed to be the people who were getting the same medication from maybe the same people that he was? I don't... Just a thought. Just a thought. While he knew of no domestic violence or substance abuse, he said Chris spoke often over the loss of his first marriage and the fact that he didn't see his other two children very much. Jericho said Chris told him once, quote, never get divorced because it's not worth it. Uh, wow. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, um, I mean, that says something. If, if that's true, that Benoit said that, that says something about a man. Chris Benoit seems to have had some principles that he did his best to stick to what he believed in. And yeah, I understand some may find that laughable considering the circumstances, but that's just the impression I get. I can't help it. Uh, anyway, he said he got the impression from Chris that Nancy resented Chris and was jealous since he was still in the wrestling business and she wasn't anymore. Chris said he didn't see or hear any signs that would have given anyone what would later happen. Okay, um, but again, you have people close to him saying, we didn't see this coming. And this here that he said he got the impression from Chris that Nancy resented Chris, maybe she did. Kind of get the feeling that they had communication problems more than anything. Well, I shouldn't say more than anything because I think clearly there was a prescription pain medicine problem, but I think communication seems to be a problem here. And that's a shame because I think those two were pretty awesome. 
And then that's all for Detective Lee. So now I think we are going to look through B. Hergesel's supplement report. On Monday, 25th June 2007, on the above date, deputies from the Fayette County Sheriff's Office responded to 130 Green Meadow Lane in reference to a welfare check. Upon arrival, deputies located three deceased bodies inside the residence. Criminal Investigation Division was notified, and I responded to the scene at approximately 1515 hours, or 315 p.m. I assisted in securing the crime scene while a search warrant was obtained by Detective Harper. And part five, I think, is about the search warrant, so you can watch that video and get all filled in on what they found after the search warrant. Upon Detective Harper's arrival with the warrant, I was assigned to search the master bedroom area. I located in the top drawer of the master bedroom closet to the door, <laughs> okay, a unknown amount of a green, leafy substance believed to be marijuana. I advised other detectives where it was located and set it on top of the dresser to be taken into custody by crime scene. And now while searching the master bedroom closet, I located several prescription bottles inside the purses located on the shelves. I placed these bottles on the top of the purse to be collected by crime scene to be taken as evidence. And oh boy, I can't imagine that Chris would be hiding prescription bottles in some of Nancy's purses. But who really knows? I am going to put a screenshot up right now of Detective Harper's report, in which he lists more specifically what prescription medications were found in the master bedroom, bathroom, and closet. Look at this. This is just crazy. And then here is another screenshot because it goes on to list prescription meds that were found in the laundry room. So, I don't know. And then also notice here we can see that what Dr. Aston said was correct, that Chris Benoit did fill a prescription on June 22nd for the pain medicine. And then that is all that is here for Detective Hergesel. And I may end this video here because we have to look through Detective Fenimore and Detective Shelton yet, I believe, unless I missed somebody. But I know Detective Fenimore, he has two or three separate supplemental reports, and although they're brief and I could go through them now, the one supplemental report is about the Delta Airlines information, and then attached to that, we have records from Delta Airlines, and then it's also what could via bank and some other things. But I think that it would be more cohesive to show you the report and then follow up with going through the information from the bank and then keep doing it that way instead of skipping back and forth. And then we also have Detective Shelton to get through yet, and his is even more involved because he is the one who looked at the phone records, and I'm starting to lose my voice from this, so bear with me, and, and looked into the internet postings. You may have heard about the Wikipedia mystery. I haven't mentioned that much, but there's a lot to get into with that. And if you're new to this Benoit story and you're not familiar with what I'm talking about with the Wikipedia mystery, I'm going to put a link in the description box below to like a 12 minute video from a YouTube channel I enjoy watching, Wrestlemania. I'm gonna put that below so you can sort of get familiar with what happened there. And I am intending fully on providing you with these files. The only reason I haven't is because it's a for, you know, a fairly selfish reason. It's because I want you guys to come back and to keep watching because I'm really going somewhere with this. Well, I'm not very tech savvy, but this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to figure out how to separate the pages in the PDF file so I can make my own smaller PDF file that would contain the documents specific to each video and then put a link with each specific video and I can go back and edit the earlier videos and add them in the description box to those as well. I think it would just be pretty awesome to get these pages into your hands sooner than later. I had no clue what I was doing when I started making these videos and you guys have been <laughs> really awesome hanging in there with me so this is the least I can do for you. I don't know. I guess it is a little selfish and I apologize for that but I can't help it. Like I'm I'm kind of I'm having fun doing this and I would like to keep doing it so you will get all this information I, I promise you and you'll see every everything that's in here and also in the description box you will find a link to the Facebook page to my channel 
It's a fairly new page. I haven't done much with it, but I'm hoping to change that very soon. You'll be able to go there to see updates as to how the next video is coming along and little comments about things I find as I'm researching different aspects of this case. So I think that'll be a really good platform for me to be able to comment to reach all of the viewers. So be sure to check that out then when you have a minute and give it a like so that you don't miss updates for the channel. And also link to my cash app in the description box. If anybody would like to make a donation or a contribution to my channel, not for me personally, but for things that I need to produce these videos essentially. And it's just simple things like paper. You wouldn't believe the amount of paper that I'm going through with these notes and these videos and binders and folders and supplies and any little bit of a contribution helps. I appreciate everything. If you've donated, you know who you are. Thank you so much. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for watching. Please share this with people. Maybe, you know, might want to see a different perspective on this whole Fenwall case. And you know, maybe if you know of somebody who likes true crime mysteries, murder mysteries, who maybe never heard of this before, the more eyes on it, the better. So please hit that thumbs up if you found this even a little bit interesting. And if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. I do intend on going into other topics. It's just that I'm really focused on this right now because this is very convoluted and I don't want to get distracted in something else and lose my train of thought with this. But um, as you can tell, I'm losing my voice, so it's time for me to end this video, and I will catch you in the next one. This has been MK. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a great day. Bye!